Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Audra Abramidis, and I am one of the K-12 Learning Technologies Consultants with the Ottawa Catholic School Board. Uh, with me today, I have Catherine Wake and Steph Pearson. They are yeah, our other two yeah. Learning Technologies Consultants with our board, and they will be here to support um, with questions and all that stuff. So we'll be taking questions throughout the session using the Google form, and at the end of the session, um, we will be uh, addressing your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and we are going to hop right into looking at Book Creator. And again, for those of you just joining us now, um, these are the links to the, this is the link for the questions. So bit.ly slash two capital L lowercase k capital S lowercase b five uppercase Z. Um, so if you do have questions as we go today, please submit them to the Google form. That link is available in the email as well as in the tweets about the session as well. So if you've missed it now, don't worry, you can still submit that later. And we're looking forward to, uh, to teaching you all about Book Creator today. So here we go. Um, I'm going to jump right in and start showing you how to access Book Creator. So Book Creator is a tool um, that is accessible by all students in our system, K-12. to um, And we recommend it really for all students, K-12. to um, It is really good. Oh, wait, let me do our land acknowledgement. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me, uh, let me jump ahead here uh, before we get too carried away. So our board does respectively acknowledge that we are located on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Indigenous territory of the Algonquin peoples on this beautiful, beautiful day on whose territory we pray, learn, play, and work. And just a short prayer, um, just to keep in mind all of those who are fighting the good fight these days. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, dear God, you created the world and have loved and cared for us ever since. Please watch over our world now. Please help all the doctors, nurses, and scientists working for healing. Please help our leaders to make good choices. Please keep our teachers and our friends safe until we can be together with them again. And please wrap your loving arms around us all and remind us how you are always our good and kind Father. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sorry about that. So, um, Book Creator, like I mentioned before, is a tool that is accessible um, by all of our students, K-12, to and by all of our educators. So whether you're a classroom teacher, an EA, an administrator, you can access this wonderful tool. Um, and we have seen amazing things happen with this tool by our students across all those grade levels as well. So regardless of where you find yourself in the system, this is an excellent tool that you can use. Um, in terms of some stats across our system, we have 2,200 teachers currently using Book Creator. 19,000 students across our system have been using Book Creator. And as of today, uh, we have about 83,000 books that have been created in, inside Book Creator with a huge increase um, just in these last few weeks as we've been learning from home and working together from home. So it's a really, really successful tool. I hope that we will sell you on it um, through this one hour session and uh, leave you with the tools that you need to get started using Book Creator in your own class. So to access Book Creator, you're going to start at the staff portal. We want to find the Book Creator icon, which is here. Um, it's a rainbow colored icon and to log in all you need to do is click on that icon Now I'm already logged in so it takes me there right away But if I wasn't logged in and I'll just jump to the student view Here's the student portal. If I was a student, I'm going to click on this icon Oops, This one's logged in too. here. I'll sign out and show you So if if I hadn't logged in before as a teacher, it would prompt me to sign in with Google as a student, it prompts me to sign in with Google. So super, super simple for logging in. This again is a student account, so I'm just gonna click on student sign in with Google. Um, but if you were a teacher, you'd choose the other one. It's going to prompt you to use your account. It's very important that you use your OCSB account or that students are using their OCSB student account because our um, premier license, our, our fancy license, covers you if you are an OCSB employee. If you log in with a Gmail address or another ad, uh, email, you will not get all the same features. So it's very important that you're logging in with an OCSB account. 
So that's how we log in. This is back to the teacher view. So just to kind of take you kind of on a little tour of our dashboard. So you'll see here that I have a variety of libraries. I'm going to show you how to create a library um, in a moment. You'll also see down here that I have a variety of libraries that have been shared with me. So these are libraries that other teachers have made and that I have joined as a co-teacher. So the great thing with Book Creator is that you can add co-teachers, whether it be an EA or a resource teacher or your principal or other teachers on staff that you're working with, teaching partners. You can add all of those people to your, uh, to your libraries and they can participate as teachers in um, supporting your students as well. The importance of creating a library is so that your students can access Book Creator. So as a student, I can log in, but if I have not joined a library, I cannot create books. So again, this is the student view, and you'll see that this student is in two libraries, but I need to, as a student, join a library in order to access the tool. So if you plan on using it with your students, it's very important that you are creating a library. So let's walk through how to do that. I'm here in my teacher dashboard. I'm going to scroll down till I see this button, create a new library. And this is unlimited. It used to be limited, but now it's unlimited. You can just, you just have a cap of a thousand books. So you're limited to the number of books you can create. At the end of a school year, you can archive libraries and your number of books will drop back down. So you will always have space. So I'm gonna create a library. I need to give it a title. So let's call this one, Grade seven math. Let's say I'm using it for that. I have a variety of options here and I'll walk you through those now. You can change these options later. So once you've made a library, you are not committed to keeping these options. They are fluid um, and you can turn them on and off as your students are working as well. So for example, um, allowing a Google image search, this is going to allow your students to use the built-in Google image search engine that's inside Book Creator. Now, if you are not comfortable with your students using Google, Google Image Search, you can turn that off. Generally speaking, for the most part, we find this is fine. It is a safe search, um, and the images that come up are free to be used um, in an educational context. Now, we have had a couple situations where there has been a picture that's come up that hasn't necessarily been the safest. However, these cases are few and far between, so generally speaking, this is a safe thing to turn on. Students can edit their own books. So once you're, when you're creating a library, you may choose that you don't want students to be able to create the books. Perhaps this is just a library of books that you have created. I know of a number of French teachers who've made a, a library of French books so that their students can hear them reading a book and reading in French and looking at the stories. Um, and so students aren't creating books. So that's an option too. Um, but we do love it as a creation tool. So generally speaking, we would leave that on. Students can read each other's books. This is a place where um, you, you can decide. So if you want student work to be private to the individual student, I would turn that off. If you want students to be able to see each other's books and collaborate, um, then you'd wanna turn that on. This option here, students can enable collaboration. Do you want them to be able to turn on the option to work with another person? If not, if you want them working independently, you would just turn that off ahead of time. And then finally, this last option, students can publish their books online. So if I turn that on, I'm gonna get this little warning message. So this says that students will be able to publish their books online. This means that when you publish a book, you will get a private link to read it, and anybody who has that link will be able to read that book. This is a web link, so it's great for sharing um, books with parents, books with um, allied health professionals. So if you're trying to share a book with a speech pathologist or a speech therapist or a psychologist or something like that, you can do that. Um, these aren't Google searchable, so they are semi-private. It's kind of like an unlisted YouTube video. So you have to have the exact web link in order to find it. So it is still fairly secure, but it's up to you and the privacy um, conversations you've had with your classroom and your students, whether or not you choose to turn that on or not. So. I'm going to turn it on because I think my students are in grade seven and I know that I don't have any privacy issues in my class. But again, that would be at the discretion of the classroom teacher and whether or not you'd like to do that. And I'm going to create my library. So now you can see here that I've got my library, grade seven math, 
And if I click on that, I can see that there's no books inside. In order to get my students to join this library, I need to show them this code. So if I click on this blue code here, students and other teachers can join this library. So if I was a teaching partner in this class or an EA coming into this class to support or a resource teacher, I could join this class with this code and I would be able to see all, like I would be able to interact with the class as a student. Um, I'll show you how to add that person as a co-teacher in a second. Um, to, for a student to add, I'm just gonna copy paste that code right now. Here is the student account. So I've joined as a student. Here's my option to join a library. I put in this code one time, I join the library, and now I'm ready to go. So for a student, it's very easy. They only have to do it one time. And to access their different libraries, the student is gonna click on this little hamburger button, and you can see that they've got three libraries that they're a part of, and they'd be able to see which teacher um, is running which library on the side, okay? Um, yeah, so that's, that's how a student would join a library. As a teacher, if I am joining a library, I would pop up, I'd first want to join with the code. So I'm the co-teacher, I'm the EA, I'm going to put that in and join a library. So um, just to show you a different view here, you can see down here, there's the option for a teacher to join a library, an educator to join a library. So I would do the same thing. I'm just going to put in that code and click join library. And then, as the, as the teacher who's running this, so this is my library, and again, I'm, I'm gonna just pop into a different library just to show you what that looks like. Yeah, so if I pop into this library, let's say, I can click on my little chevron here, and I can see who has joined my library. So I'm the teacher here, um, but I can see that I've got all these other authors. So I have Steph Pearson in here as a, uh, as another author, if I would like to promote her to co-teacher, I'm going to click on these three dots and I'm going to promote her to co-teacher. And now she's able to read, edit, and publish any of the books that I have in that library. So I can confirm that. And you'll see now that she pops up as a co-teacher and in her dashboard, that library would show up down here in the shared with me section. So she would now be able to access that library. If I need to remove her, so let's say it's the end of the term, and she is no longer working in my class, for example, I can remove her as a co-teacher. Or if I only needed her there for a little bit, I can remove her as well. Or if I accidentally promoted a student to a co-teacher, which happens for sure, don't worry, you can unpromote them very easily. Um, yeah, so that's where we get all those, those authors. I also have the option here, so if this student was in here as an accident, I can remove them as a user. Or if they're doing something in there that's inappropriate and I need to remove them for whatever reason, I can take them out. Um, so that's really easy to do as well. This is also a great place to check to see if students have um, properly put in the code and, and joined your library properly. So that is how to join a library. So we're going to go back to the library that I've just made. And I'm going to walk you through how to uh, make a book. So just to kind of recap, over here at the library settings wheel, um, this is where you can change any of those settings. So these are the settings I set up when I first started the library. Um, and so I can go in and change these at any point throughout, throughout the, uh, the process. So to make a book, I'm going to click on this giant yellow button that says plus sign new book. With our little elementary students, we like to teach them about, we say, what is the symbol for adding something? And they all say plus sign. And we say, yes, absolutely. So you're gonna hit the plus sign to make a new book. Um, with our high school students, they're typically able to figure it out pretty easily. Giant yellow button, so they click on the plus sign. Your first option is to choose a book shape. Now this, you cannot change once you've selected. Um, however, you could go in, delete your book and start over again. Um, but in terms of the options, they're very similar. They're pretty straightforward. Um, the shape and size is really up to the individual user. If you know that you're going to be sharing your book on a platform where you need a square image, then you might choose that one. But really, it doesn't matter what shape and size you're using. Um, the comic book templates on the bottom have a few more options in terms of formatting and tools. So typically, especially if I'm working with older students, um, or really like anyone grade two and older kind of thing, I often recommend the comic book templates because 
Um, there's just a few more things that you can do. If you're looking for a more um, simple kind of interface, then using one of these top books um, is a good option because there's a few less choices. Um, so it's a little bit more straightforward to kind of get it and work. But really, either option is going to be great. Um, you're just not going to have all the different comic options with these with these books. So I'm going to pick a comic option just to just to showcase all of the features. And this is what it looks like. So we have a blank page, and we can start designing right away. Along the top, um, this is going to bring you back to your books, back to your library. The pages button I'm going to come back to later. Our undo button is a very good button. We like to teach our students how to use the undo button. So if they make a little mistake, it's just a click of the undo button, and they can go back to the beginning. And then over here, we've got a plus, we've got an I, and we've got a play button. So again, with the students, we often say, what do you think we're going to click on to add things to our page? And lo and behold, sure enough, that plus button is there. They've got three little menus here. So as I was saying with those plainer, kind of more simple books, they wouldn't have that comic option. Okay, So you would still have media and you would still have shapes, but you won't have this comic option here. So I'm going to walk through the media option first, just because these are kind of our basic frontline tools, and then we'll go, we'll go from left to right. So on my cover, let's say I want to put in a picture. I'm going to click on Import, and you'll see that this is where I find my Google image search. So let's say I want some tulips on my cover. I can go through here. I can scroll, and I can find a picture of tulips that I'd like to include on my cover. I'm going to hit Select, and boom, there's my beautiful picture of tulips. So that might be the cover. Once I've inserted an image, I've got options to shrink it down. I can use this green thing to turn it, put it on a little bit of an angle. Um, lots and lots of choices there. So I can, I can do that. If I click on this I button with this highlighted, this is the inspector. It allows me to edit whatever is highlighted. So you'll notice here that there's an accessibility option here. So I could say these are beautiful tulips. And as this, when the student has this book read to them using the play button, if they are a student who has a visual impairment and relies on those accessibility tools, the book will say, this is a picture of beautiful tulips exactly as I read there. So that's a really nice feature in there. It also gives me the option to put in a web address. So let's say I want to put in the link to the Tulip Festival, for example. I could put in that link there, and that image would become a hyperlink that students could just click on. Coming back to our plus sign under media, um, I also have the option here to put in some text. So maybe I want to put in a title. You'll notice here that there's only a couple basic options for changing font or uh, for formatting. I'm going to show you editing tools after I get some text in there. Um, but I also have this microphone, the Tulip Festival. It's got great speech to text capability. Um, we love showing this to our students, especially our younger ones. Um, so they don't have to be using Read and Write. They can use this integrated tool that's already built in. So I can put in that. I can change any of my font if I need to. If I want, I can make it bold here, italics uh, or underline. And I have the option to put in a link here as well. I also have the option here to zoom in a little bit. It's only got two sizes, but it does give us that option just to be able to see the letters a little bit bigger if we need to. And then I'm going to hit Done. Now, in terms of a cover page, that text looks kind of boring. So I'd like to kind of jazz it up a little bit here. My box is highlighted. Now when I come over here and click on the inspector, you'll notice that it gives me all of my text editing options. So I can drag that size and make it a little bit bigger. I can change my font to something that might work a bit better for my students. I can change my color. So maybe I want these letters to be purple. I want to drag that. Maybe I'm going to spin it around. So I've got some really nice options for adjusting, adjusting that font. Okay. Um, background will give me a nice background on the uh, on the uh, on that box if I want it there. And I also have the option to put shadows and move things front to back. So that is that is how I would edit my text and change my text a little bit. I'm ready for a new page, so I'm going to just hit next page. 
gives me a blank page. So super simple to add pages. And I can just use the arrows on my keyboard as well, and they will give me more pages. Um, this time, I'm going to go to media, and I want to see what my camera can do. Now, I'm going to be a little bit limited with my camera because I am recording right now um, with a Google Meet. But typically, um, my camera will get, oops, my camera gives me the options to either take a photo or record a video. We love that this is built right into the tool because it doesn't mean, you're st or it means that students don't need to go and like grab an iPad or a Chromebook, take pictures, upload them to Google Drive, and then bring them in. They can do all of that stuff right inside Book Creator. So if I click on record video, it's going to give me a three, two, one countdown, and it immediately turns on the Chromebook or device webcam and will record a video. Same thing with a picture, it's going to turn on that device uh, webcam and take a photo right there. Three, two, one, go. Students can take multiple takes and they'll just insert directly onto the page. Um, the next one is pen. And the pen tool is great for drawing, for cartoons, all kinds of stuff. So we've got the option to change color up here. We've got all these magical colors, which students really love. So I can, I can choose to draw with my finger and you'll notice that the ink is changing as I go. So that's kind of fun. I'm going to just undo that. Um, I'm going to change the type of drawing I'm doing. So I'm going to click on this auto draw. So you've got all these different pencils, crayon marker. So you've got some options there. Auto draw down here gives me the option. Um, I'm going to draw what I think is a boat. Um, yes, of course I meant canoe. So here's my rainbow canoe and it is ready for a voyage. And now I want to draw something else. So I'm gonna click on auto draw again, and I wanna draw a tent. I'm thinking already about camping and hopefully we get to do some of that this summer. Uh, you'll notice here I still have my color picker so I can change the color of my tent and, um, and hit done. And so you'll see that students can, can get really creative with these drawing tools in terms of putting a bunch of stuff together. You've also got emojis up here. So if you've got students, if you're looking to um, have students do anything with emotions, of course they can, they can do that. Um, you can drag these, emotion, these emojis in and they can write a little story with emojis or simply use them to jazz up their, um, their cartoons, their images. Um, so we've got all these fun little little creatures there. So that's the that's the drawing tool, the pen tool. Um, we typically recommend um, if you're doing this with a class, the students love the pen tool and they will spend hours with the pen tool. So sometimes when we're leading a class to show them how to use Book Creator for the first time, we won't show it to them yet, um, just so that they uh, they can focus on the task at hand and kind of get through everything. Um, but it is a lot of fun, and again, if you're looking at getting your students to make comic books and stuff, it's it's a really great way to bring in all these little images um, without necessarily needing to do the Google search. Um, finally, the record option is an it's a voice recorder, so it'll allow me to if I start the recording, it's going to give me a countdown, and now it's recording my voice. So anything that I say is going to be recorded, and that becomes a little button in my screen. So if I hit stop. I can preview it here, or I can use it. And now I've got this nice little button. So maybe I want Mr. Fox here. Oops. I'm gonna give the speech bubble over here to Mr. Fox. I'm gonna shrink it right down, drag this to Mr. Fox's mouth, and I'm gonna move this little guy to the front, and I'm gonna put it on top. So now I've got something that Mr. Fox is saying in my drawing. So that's something that you can do um, to get kind of clever, and it's a really, really nice way to hear student thinking, student learning, um, without necessarily needing them to do speech to text. Um, so, so it's a nice alternate if you have students with an accent or if you have students who have um, difficulties with speech and sometimes the speech to text doesn't work, this voice recording tool that's built into Book Creator is a really, really great option for having them share their thinking go to another page and just show you so those are kind of all your base options under the import option you also have the option to bring in a google map so i can search for ottawa for example and bring in a google map and this is as a geography teacher this is a really fun way to get students to identify different places um, and you also have the option to bring in uh, google drive files and um, files from your computer 
these will show up as little icons. So they won't actually be like the actual thing, but it'll take you to that file if you have access to it. And then the embed code allows you to embed anything that has an embed code. So a YouTube video, for example, um, or something like that. Moving onward, if I click on the comic option, I've got all of these comic options. What I love the most is using the panels, and I don't always use these to make um, comic books. Sometimes I use this as a graphic organizer. So sometimes these become my four boxes. I need my students to give me four ideas. Here are those four boxes for my four ideas. And students can then put information inside those ideas. So they can provide structure. Um, if you click on them, you'll notice that you've got the option to bring in an image. So I could say dog, for example, and bring in this puppy dog, and it'll just stick it right into the frame beautifully. Um, I also have the option to select the photo, and again, it's not going to let me because I'm currently using my camera, but if I was, it would let me take a photo as well. Underneath the comic book options, again, you've got your speech and thought bubbles, you've got kind of your more jazzy um, comic book style text, and then you've got all these stickers. So if I want to add a wow, I can, uh, I can stick those. Our last menu here is our shapes menu, and these are really great. So I'm just gonna go to a new page here. These are great, um, again, if you need to create a border or a boundary for your students to work inside. So the default is blue, but again, we're going to give over here to the inspector, and I can change the color to white, and I can change my, I can turn my border on, and I can make my border black, and now all of a sudden I have a box that I can move around my page and that my students right inside. If I double click on it, I can type. So this is a great way again to build graphic organizers for your students, especially if they need that chunking or that support um, with a little boundary, less, less open-ended than, than a big white page. Um, but I can also use them as they are and, and create all kinds of fun math games with that too. If I don't want the triangle to be red, of course I can change it, no problem. So those are kind of our creation tools for creating books. Um, once a book is done, I can click on this play button and flip through, and you'll see that it looks a little bit more formal. If I click on read to me, the tulip festival. These are beautiful tulips. Remember that I put in that accessibility for the text for that picture. So it read to me what is in that picture because I added that text. These are beautiful tulips. And now it's recording my voice. So any, so what it'll do is it's going to read anything that you have on the page that is text. And if you have any kind of uh, mixed media, so a little voice recording or a video or something like that, it'll read that as well. It will not read all of the little names on the map, don't you worry. Um, but it will read the text to the students. So it's a really great way. Um, I like sometimes creating a template, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Um, and if the students are non-readers, having them click the Read to Me button, they can listen to that those instructions, and then they can um, and then they can jump right into back editing, and then working on the task from there. So that's a really really great option. For those of you who are teaching French, you can change the language. So by going to the Read to Me and changing the voice. So right now I'm on my staff device, so I only have English because that is the only language pack I've added to my staff computer. Um, if you are a French teacher, you would want to add um, France French, and then you'll be able to have it read to you in French. On the student Chromebooks, this is way easier. So on a student Chromebook, they'll be able to choose between French, between English, no problem. Um, and so if you are doing something in French on, on Book Creator, no problem, you can absolutely switch that language very, very easily. You'll notice that you have these options for, um, for how it's read to you. So whether, like if, if you want it to read more slowly, if you want the pages to not flip automatically, you can turn all that off or on. And you can also go full screen. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna pop into my library here. I've got a pre-created library here just to show you a couple other features. So this is a book that I've created in advance. This is a template book. So I made this book and what I want my students to do is actually make a copy of this book and then add their own thinking. 
So you'll notice that each page has some activities for the students to do. Um, and all they would need to do is actually fill that box with the information. And you'll see that it just kind of goes on. It's the same template every time, just with the different letters of the alphabet. So what my students could do, if my students joined this library, um, and I'm just going to show you here as student 17. So I'm here as student 17. I have logged into this library, and I can see my teacher's book. Students will always see whatever books the teachers have made, so just know that. I'm going to click on this little pile of books. Again, I'm a student. And I'm going to click on copy book. It's going to ask me which library I want to copy it to. And I'm going to click on sample library because that's the one I'm in. And now you'll see that it says copy, sample template, and it has my name, student 17. So now as a student, I can go in here and I can edit this book. So if I'm working on this page, I can look for an animal that starts with the letter A. I'm going to think about an ant and I can add a picture of that creature to that page and now uh, my teacher will get that work okay so this is the student view popping back into the teacher view you'll see here that I can see here's my original template here's my student work so if I click on this I can now see that my student is working along and I can see the work that the student is doing okay so this is a really nice option. I've seen some great examples, both from our kinder and kind of primary years, but also um, there's a great teacher at Frank Ryan who's using this for math. He's creating little uh, math activities and the students log into the library, they make a copy of the book and then they do their math activity in there. What it's done is it's allowed for the students in his class to be able to use a variety of different tools within Book Creator to share their thinking. So when I visited his class, some of the students were using the voice recorder to share their math thinking. Some of the students were drawing and doing little tally ticks with the pen tool. Some students were using the simple textbook or text box and writing things out that way. So it really provides that differentiation right there. And you as the teacher just are creating one thing. All those tools are built in there for the students. So the templates option is really nice. And again, you just need to create one template and then it's good to go. In terms of my template here, when I was building it, um, if I click on pages here, I told you I'd come back to this, you can see that I can see all of my pages. Do you think I made all 26 pages one at a time? Oh no. All I did was I clicked on the, I made the A page, I clicked on the three dots and I said copy. And then all I needed to do was change the letter and actually type in the letter on each page. Okay, so if you create a template, let's say you're trying to get students to create a visual essay in high school or a comic book and you want them to only have so many pages or what have you, you can create that template, create one page, copy that page, um, and, and you can be really flexible that way. I can also drag my pages around. So if I've got stuff in the wrong order, I can drag things around that way. And the students can do that too. So if I was a student working on my book, I can click on pages, and I can also drag and drop and move my pages around, which is really nice. Um, what else do we have here? So underneath here in the book stack, you'll see that I can also move to library. So if I as a student accidentally move, put this book in the wrong place, I can move to a library and I can move it to the other libraries here that I have available to me. Um, this is a really good thing to know in case you've got students, you've got two teachers teaching the same kid, they're in two different classes. Student starts building a book in the other teacher's library. Very easy to be able to move it into yours. You can copy the book as I showed you already. You can import a book. So if you've got one um, on your hard drive or something like that, you can pull it in. And you can also combine books. So this is a really nice option if you are looking to make a class book. I've seen, um, again, using kindergarten as an example, each student made a one page book about one letter of the alphabet. And then they pulled all those pages together just by clicking on the books they want to combine and hitting next, our class book. And I can create a book this way. Okay, so I have that ability to pull everything together really, really easily as well. Okay. Um, the other options here that you have, um, those, so those are all those options. I can also delete the book. Um, it will ask if you're sure, and um, it can be recovered for two weeks, which is nice. So if you accidentally delete it, do not panic, it'll be there for you. If I click on this little share button, you'll see that I've got these options. 
So I have the option to publish my book online. It's going to make me title it. So I, if I haven't given it a title, it will force me to do that, which is really great in terms of teaching our students that skill. Um, when I hit publish, it's going to celebrate me and say, hooray, you've published this. This is the link now that I can share with other people. So if I want to share that with parents or if, again, I want to share it with a speech therapist or somebody else in the community, um, I can do that very easily. Um, I can stop publishing as well. So like, let's say I just want to share it with a parent for the one day and then stop because I'm worried about privacy. I can then hit that stop publishing button and it will stop. The other options here, download as an ebook or print. So if you do have concerns around privacy, these two options are great for sharing um, with, our, with our parent community. Um, the only thing is that you're a bit limited in terms of what you'll see. So if I print this book, um, it's going to print as a PDF, which means that any of my interactive pieces, so if I had any um, audio or video or anything, none of that would show up, okay? Um, and so that's that's just a little bit limiting in terms of the sharing, but you can certainly print them if you want to. So if a student just has images and text, then that's a nice option. The collaborate button here is they've recently kind of jazzed it up. Um, so when you want to start collaboration, I can this is my default setting is the book can be edited by everybody in the library. Now, as a classroom teacher, you can see how that might be problematic because we might get students accidentally editing other students' books when they really should only be editing their own group's book. So if I hit change, oops, you'll see now that I can choose who can edit that book. So maybe I just want student 17 and student 18 plus the teacher to be able to edit that book. And then I would hit done, okay? Um, and I can go back in there and adjust that at any time, okay? Um, if I want, I can just stop collaboration altogether. And now you'll see that that symbol went away and nobody is working on that book now. This is a very, very new feature. Um, they always had collaboration in there, but they now have that ability, or you now as the teacher or the educator have the ability to change and kind of customize who can work on what book. So if you've got students working on partners on a book, I can go through and, and adapt that um, as the classroom teacher, which is really, really nice. Finally, you'll see that play button shows up here as well. So if I click that, it gives me the option to have the book read to me out loud. Um, and that's kind of in a nutshell, all, all that is Book Creator. Now, there are so many things that you can do with it. We have seen teachers do some amazing, amazing things. Everything from co-op presentations in high school to science labs, to music journals, to math journals, to alphabet books and all kinds of things. Um, it's a really, really nice option for creating comic books, as I mentioned before. Um, so for those of you who've used Pixton all the time um, and had your students creating comic books, why not use this one, choose the comic book template, and have students create their comic books right inside here. Um, this is, it's great for that. They can kind of get a little bit more creative in, ter in terms of putting in pictures of themselves instead of just an avatar, it's an actual photo of themselves. Um, and they can they can put in little little clip art and stuff like that as well. Um, they can also use that pen tool to draw to auto draw little characters or use the emojis or bring in pictures from Google Draw uh, or sorry Google uh, Google Images. So there's lots and lots of choices there. Um, so we love it for that. In terms of some other things to help you as a teacher, um, there is a resource tab within the teacher dashboard. So if I click on resources you'll see that they've got resources sorted by grade. So you can choose your panel. And you can also choose your subject area in terms of deciding, you know, if I'm looking for ideas for math, I can click on math and it's going to give me some ideas across the, across the world about how teachers are using Book Creator for math. It gives you some sample projects. Um, it gives you videos and additional resources there, some tips and that kind of stuff. So there's lots and lots of really great resources built into the teacher dashboard. These books down here are beautiful and give you some really great ideas um, just for getting started with Book Creator and different types of projects that you can use Book Creator for. It's not just a tool for a language arts classroom. It's not just for English. Um, yes, it is technically a book that you're making. However, because of the interactive nature of the tool, you can use it for literally any subject area and any grade level. 
Um, we've seen teachers get really creative with providing feedback to their students in these. So like if this was my student book and I wanna give the students some feedback, as a teacher, I can then pop in and add speech bubbles maybe on the side here and I can put my feedback in here. Here is my feedback. Or I can put in a voice recording and that student can then go in and listen to my feedback afterwards as well. So lots and lots of options for providing feedback in the book as well. Um, and I think we'll pull over to, um, just wanna, oh yeah, in the slide deck that I have for you, it kind of goes through step by step everything that I went through today on how to create a book, how to combine books, all that stuff. Um, so if there's anything that you missed, um, don't hesitate to please look at those slides. Um, these are some samples from our system. So we were recently featured, Book Creator did a little case study and uh, they, they asked for some samples from our system. So these are just a few of the samples that we got from the OCSB, which are public. So you can uh, have consent from their parents and from the students to share these. So feel free to go and take a look at some of those samples just to get some ideas. Um, the resource library, they also have a YouTube channel. So there's lots and lots of stuff there that, that'll give you more information. Um, but the best way to learn is honestly to just go and make a book. So I would suggest after today, after this session, that you pop into Book Creator, make a library, and just start making books. That was how I learned, and it was the uh, the best way to do it. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, and if you've got little kids at home, get them to make some books. Um, they can certainly join your library, and they can they can play and make some books. And they'll probably teach you things that that <laughs> you may have missed. Um, your learning technologies consultants, we are also available to you. So this is us by family of schools, but if you're looking for, um, for more support or if you, need, if you need a little help kind of getting started or if you get started and have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are here and we're happy to help you. Um, we've done some of these mini webinars with um, staff groups from schools too. So if you're a principal and you're listening and you'd like us to uh, virtually come into your school and run a little session, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to run a lunch and learn or a coffee and learn or whatever it is. Um, and then after the session, there's a link here if you want to provide us with some feedback um, on the session. We would appreciate it. So I'm just going to skip out of this and stop sharing my screen and pop to see if we have any questions. We do have a few questions, Audra, from the Google form. Okay. Um, we had some great feedback saying how awesome you were. So okay. uh, it was really, really, really well done. So one of the first questions you got was, what does the 1,000 book limit include? Does that mean the teacher has 1,000 books and each student has 1,000 books? What does that 1,000 book actually mean? Great question. So I'm just gonna pop back in here and click on my little face. So you'll see here that I am part of the OCSB school plan. It's a 1,000 book plan. So that means that as a teacher, I can have students make 1,000 books in my libraries. One thing that I have um, heard, the, generally speaking, this is fine. So if you make your libraries through the year, this should be enough for you through a school year. And then at the end of the school year, all you would have to do is archive the library, and then you will have access to, um, to the, that number of books again. Um, one thing that I've heard from especially some elementary teachers is, oh my gosh, you came in, you showed my class how to use Book Creator. The kids loved it. They went home and they went crazy and just started making books. Um, so if you are a teacher, especially right now of an elementary class, especially, you may want to make a for fun library as well as a serious library for whatever it is you're doing. Um, and in, and ask the students if they want to play and just make books for fun to make them in the for fun library, because then you can just kind of constantly archive that and make new ones over and over again. Um, but it will fill up your library, um, or it will take up a lot of space. So it's nice to have that option to be able to archive that but then keep the work that they're doing separate. Um, and as long as you've logged in with your OCSB account, you should have access to this thousand book plan. Um, so if for some reason that's not coming up, um, just make sure you're logged into Chrome up here um, and that you're not logged into another personal account on this and you should be able to log in no problem. And always go through the portal just to be yeah, on the safe side. Portal, definitely, yeah. Um, we do have a, we got a lot of questions about templates, but you answered that really well during the session. Um, another question you got was, can you show again how to use it in French? So does that French uh, capability, when they use text to speech, can students speak in French and it writes in French? Can you just clarify 
how it works for French teachers? Yes. So it should do that for you. So this was a French library that I made. Um, trying to remember. So for the students, if they, yeah, the language itself, they would choose when they go to read the book. Where did? Uh, putting me on the spot here. I know I have a French book, so I'm trying to <laughs> remember how I did that. Um, I believe that I had to change the language on my Chromebook. Um, so this was, for example, a book that I did in French, and I used the speech to text to do that. But I did this on a Chromebook, and I changed the Chromebook language to French. And when I did that, it automatically made Book Creator French. So it, it's, Book Creator is going to be intuitive to whatever language your computer is set to. So I'm on my staff device. My staff device is set to English. You can see down here in the corner of my screen that I'm set on English. Um, but if I changed it to French, then I would have the functionality of Book Creator would turn into French. So if you are a French teacher using it in a French class, you would just want to teach the students to flip over to French, which I know a lot of our French teachers already do often. Um, and then they should be able to interact with the book in French using the voice typing and all that. And when they click on play to have it read to them, again, you'd want to just change the voice. And it, my, my computer's not a good example, but if I was on a Chromebook, you would see, I think there's about eight languages or so that show up here if, if you're on a Chromebook, um, French being one of them. They can change the voice to French and they'd be able to listen to that and it would read it beautifully in French. And the French is very, very good. It's, it's quite good. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, I, I guess this kind of lends itself well to that one is how do you support English language learners with Book Creator? Oh, good question. Um, so with English language learners, I, again, um, one of my favorite things about Book Creator is the fact that you've got these options to, sorry, I'm just going to pop into here again. You've got these options to use the, um, the recording option as well as the camera for video. So if I have students who have very, very heavy accents, but I wanna hear them speaking and I wanna hear their ideas, um, in terms of, I, I don't necessarily need to navigate speech to text because I can hear them speak. Um, so those are two beautiful options for ELLs. Um, the text-to-speech does work as well, but again, if they are struggling um, with, with an accent and if the accent isn't getting picked up clearly, um, then that, that might be problematic. Um, you can create books in here for your ELL. So if I was teaching like secondary level ELL students um, and I'm looking and saying, okay, Raz Kids is books for kids. So I need something that's age appropriate. I could as a teacher make my own books in here that are age appropriate. Um, and then students have the option to listen to those books. So again, using it as a teaching tool and being able to use it that way. Um, but because the, because the interface is so visual, students are pretty adept at picking it up. And we've seen quite a few um, ELL classes picking it up and using it and, and having great success with it. So it's definitely a good one to try. Awesome. Uh, a couple more questions to go. So when you we looked at the books in the library, um, can you see the student who creates the book? So if you just want to show that again, where the student name is attached to it, um, mm -hmm. where the title of the book you have to kind of write it in two different places, which I'm sure you're going to show. Um, but just so that the teacher knows who did what, can you just show that again? Sure. Yeah. So if I'm in a library, and I'll, I'll go to a library where I've got a few more um, authors here. So if I'm in um, this playground one, for example, I can see at the bottom here, this is the title. And I can actually change the title here, too. Like, this is the new title. So I can change that. You'll see my name here. If I want to remove my last name, I can also remove the last name and just have my first name there. So that's that's an option as well. Um, and if I click next, I can just scroll through scroll through these books and see who's is getting work done in here. Um, if I don't like that view, if I've got a huge class or if there's like a hundred books in there, I can also click up here to this grid mode and it makes the book smaller. So it makes it a little bit easier to navigate. So again, if you have a class who's super eager and all of a sudden they've got 150 books, this might be an easier option for you. And then I can just hover over top of those books. It just shows me the title, not the author in this view, but, uh, but it does let me kind of navigate that way. And all the student books, will, they save automatically um, and they will just show up there for you. Awesome, thank you.
Um, next question. If you wanted to do one of those templates, but you only wanted one page, would you do the template then on the cover of the book? So that's the one page or would you do it on page two? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really up to you as the teacher. I would probably just do it on the one page out of simplicity. Um, so new book and here's, let's pick the shape. So let's say I want my students to um, write a paragraph and I want them to have, here's my main idea and here's my three supporting points. Um, that might be my template. And I might, like maybe I'll prompt the students by putting in some little, little captions, main idea. Thinking back to those days when I taught 7-8 English, I would have used this for sure. Um, the beautiful thing with this too is that you can, um, students can use their voice. Um, so if you have students who again are looking for, who are needing some of those supports, um, accommodations and stuff, if you've got a class with 20 kids with IEPs, this is a tool that you definitely want to be using because a lot of those accommodations are built into the tool already for you. Um, so as a teacher, you know, like I can create something like this and my students can make a copy. And as soon as they go in to do the work, um, all they need to do is choose their modality, choose their strength, whether they're speaking, whether they're writing, whether they're using images, and they can put in um, put in those, those ideas here. I saw a grade 10 class actually um, use this and they wrote history essays for their history class in this but the teacher actually told them it had to be visual and then their their words had to be oral or video um, and the books were really really cool looking because each box just had a picture and then and then the students kind of verbal verbal thinking so it was a really neat way to uh, to see their thinking Awesome. The questions are coming in feverishly, which is very exciting. So we're going to keep this going until we answer all of the questions. Um, another question, do you mind just reviewing how to uh, increase the text size and change the font? Because we know that that's uh, a common frustration, especially when we're working with younger students, is that it's not as intuitive as we would hope. So can you just explain how they would go about doing that? Sure, no problem. So here is my story. I've got some text. I'm going to just write it out. This is my ideal summer, let's say. I'm going to hit done. You'll see my font is really basic. I need to select this blue box. So if I'm clicked over here and I click on the eye, it just gives me page backgrounds. I need to click on the box with my text, click eye, and then I have the options here to change my text. Uh, play with that. This is, I would say, probably the number one thing that that is not as intuitive with it. Um, but once students know, um, then it's it tends to be okay. But this tends to be where we get a lot of questions from students, like, "Hey, I just want to change my font. I want to make it bigger." Um, so blue box, oops, blue box. Click on I, and then you've got all of your font features there. Awesome. If a student uh, is copying your template, does that template get locked or do they are they able to change the template once they've made a copy? They could change the template technically. So once they've made a copy, they can really do whatever they want to it. So here I'm going to go in as this is me as a student and let's go to this, this one. Um, so here's the template my teacher just made for me. I'm going to make a copy of it. So here's my copy. Um, you'll notice that I can click on this and I can move it around. So I can delete that. It is not locked. Um, and even these boxes, you'll see, have the little lock buttons on them. But as a student, I could right click and unlock. So, you know, your students are going to be able to do whatever they want here um, and delete stuff accidentally and all that. The beautiful thing is that if they accidentally delete everything and make a big mess of it, your template is always in the is always in the library, and they can always make another copy. So if they, for for whatever reason, delete everything, um, they can make another copy, or they can just go back and reference the teacher's template. So it is there for for reference if they if they accidentally delete something. Um, yeah. Awesome, Audra. Oh no, I archived a library by mistake. Where would I find those books? Oh, good question. So archived libraries, you'll see up here, there's this little button next to my face. If I click on archived libraries, you'll see that I've got all of these old libraries and these are actually from last school year. So they are still here, even a year later after my visit to Frank Ryan. So we've got all these archived libraries. 
Um, and so they are available. If I just click on it, you'll see I can even find just the actual books here. And I can click on that book and I can either copy it to my books, um, which would bring it into my private library, or I can go up here and I can restore that library as well or delete it forever. So I've got lots of options in there. Great question. Um, another, uh, we actually had a tip come in too as well in terms of locking the template. Um, you could use it as a picture and insert it as a background. So I did not know that. So that's uh, a handy tip if you wanted to go that route about locking the template. Um, another question, can you have one student in one library? Yeah. Yeah, so if I, if I needed to, I could create a new library just for that one student, absolutely. So this could be Billy's library. Poor Bill Corcoran, we always pick on him, but he's got his own library here. And uh, I would just share that code with him and he could do all of his work in there. So yeah, really great option, especially if we've got some students with really high needs in our classes or something and we want a space for them to work. Or if we have a student who's really disrupting, um, who's really disrupting things in our regular library. So if we have the students working on a collaborative task or something um, where they're working together and you, you have a kid who's in there and just, just causing all kinds of trouble, well, we remove Billy from that library, we put him in his own, and now he is, he is able to just work at his own pace in his own space. So, yeah. And oh, Billy. Or Billy. Oh, Billy. Um, all right, another question. Um, the first time students log in on Chromebooks or another device, um, it asks permission to use the camera and microphone. What happens if the student accidentally hit no? Where would they go to change that so that they can use the text-to-speech and they could use the camera and book creator? Oh, good question. So you should see up here in the Omni box, there is a little icon. So this camera and microphone allowed. Um, and this would be the same if you're working in Screencastify or anything where anything that requires a camera and microphone. Um, and so chances are they've checked off this block button. So you want to just check this continue allowing. Um, you want to switch that and then hit done and it'll save those settings for the student. So it's up in the Omni box and they should, theirs might be if they've blocked it, it might have like a little red X on it. So they would just click that and then change those settings. Awesome. Um, another question that was coming in, uh, in terms of seeing what your students have done, uh, we know that sort of like using tools like Hapra and Google, you can quickly see what the student has been working on. Um, but in terms of Book Creator, to see what they've, like what page they've been working on, can you actually see just the singular page that they've been working on? Or would you have to go through the whole book to find out where they've been working? You would have to go through the whole book. I don't think, I don't believe there is a feature. Um, yeah, you would just see the covers of the book. So you would have to go in and actually click on the book. Um, but I might ask my students maybe to send me a message or if they've, if they've published the book, for example, they could publish it and share the link with me in Workspace and let me know what page I've just finished. Um, so that might be a nice way if, if it is a really big book, like let's say this is a book that I'm working on through the entire school year. Um, I could I could just have the students every so often publish that book um, and then and then just tell me what page they want me to look at and that helps me focus that down a little bit. Awesome. Can you rename a library and can you remove a student from a library? Yes, you can do both those things. So if I click up here, I can remove a student by clicking here and just clicking on remove user and then they will lose access to the library and their books will be deleted. So that is just important to know. Um, if you don't want their books to be deleted, like let's say in the case of little Billy there, I might I might move Billy's books over, sorry, I might move Billy's books over to his new library first and then remove him from this one just so that his work doesn't get deleted. Um, and again, we would do that by moving the book to the to the new library and then removing that student. Um, and what was the second part of the question? No, I think you answered it, renaming the library oh, and removing a student. Renaming the library. Um, so to rename the library, I would just click these three dots. Oh no, wait. I'm gonna go in here to the settings and I can just change it up here. So maybe this is like, Can you yeah. copy and paste from Google? Yes. An image? Yep, and I actually, students showed me how to do that. <laughs> So um, sometimes you'll find, because this is a safe search, um, sometimes when the students go to add an image, they will actually not find the image that they're looking for specifically. So like they're looking for an image of Paris, 
and they're like, I don't really like these pictures that I'm finding, but I found this other great one on the internet. Um, and I've seen students, they've just Googled Paris, for example, and images. And let's say it's this image, they've just kind of clicked on it. Oops. Let's see if I can get, yeah, so they've clicked and dragged, and then they've like dropped the image onto the page. Oops, hold on, I may not have done that properly. Oh no, anyway. It, it does work, <laughs> um, but it's just like a drag and drop kind of thing. So yeah, it does it does work. Um, it's not as friendly, but the students the students can do it. Yeah. All right, last question before I'll let Steph uh, sort of hop on and just sort of close it up. But uh, for students who haven't used Book Creator before, are there tutorials or that you can send to your students? Uh, I know one teacher had also said that. Could she maybe perhaps make a screencastify and send that to her students to show them how to use it? That's a great idea. Yeah. So Steph, uh, Steph did create a video on using Book Creator early on in this teaching from home uh, time. So it is in the in our OCSB how to channel. Um, but yeah, I would say honestly, the best way to do it would be to make your own book um, and send. Like if you publish the book, then you can send that link to your students and they can read your book and learn how to use Book Creator by reading your book, which is fun. Um, or you could make a screencast of yourself, teach them how to get started and share that screencast with them as well. So yeah, those are some really great options. Um, we always love when teachers um, jump in and 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 do that, do that um, because it adds that personal touch. So yeah, we definitely recommend that. Um, otherwise, the like I mentioned on the resources page, some of these places might have things for you, like the YouTube channel and stuff. There's there's places there um, where you can find some materials. So definitely lots of places you can go. So thank you so much, Audra, for uh, for leading us through this. Uh, thank you for everyone who's been able to participate, who has provided questions, who is giving up some of their, their time at home, uh, making time in their chaotic lives of whatever might be happening. Or maybe you're having a chill afternoon and you just feel like, hey, I'm going to learn some book reader. All of you, thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, on one of the last slides that, uh, that Audra shared, there is feedback, um, uh, a survey so we can get some feedback, um, whether you're finding this uh, valuable, whether you found the, the method valuable. And um, we just really, really appreciate uh, your, your uh, participation. Um, and uh, yeah, so we really appreciate anything. Oh, and then um, we have videotaped this entire document. Um, so we will be putting up on the PD site and we'll also uh, make sure that we tweet it out and you'll be able to access it. So that will be accessible by anyone, um, not necessarily just OCSB uh, domain users. So um, we'll make sure that everybody gets that as well. So yeah, we, we will be sharing that on our OCSB how-to channel. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and there's a certification coming soon. So for those of you who love getting your certifications, um, stay tuned because we've got um, a certification coming soon from Book Creator. So you'll be able to get certified in this. It's actually a perfect timing to do the webinar because you can play and you can learn and then get all really good at it. And then as soon as the certification is available, you can hop in and do that. It's going to be like an hour long, kind of like the screen one. And then you get one of those fun little badges for the bottom of your, uh, your emails. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to any any of us at all. We are more than happy to address any of those questions and uh, share the link with you and your staff and all of that stuff. So thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.